Hi there. Welcome everyone to our third webinar in the Parkinson's Foundation 10th Expert Briefing Series. Uh, today's topic is non-motor symptoms, what's new? And this is the first one for 2019, so I want to wish everyone a happy new year. I'm Dr. James Beck, uh, Chief Scientific Officer at the Parkinson's Foundation and your host for our discussion today. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I talk about this um, all the time, but I just cannot emphasize enough that these webinars that we've created uh, year in, year out are really based upon the feedback of the Parkinson's community. So when we have surveys posted at the end of our um, uh, webinar today, please fill them out. Um, please uh, keep an eye out as we uh, look to the community to come up with new ideas uh, each year. And we also work very closely with the Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson's Organizations, or AIRPO. Uh, these are other organizations which also have uh, a roots to the community as well, so that what we present to everybody on our expert briefing series is what everyone's looking for. So if you're looking at the uh, presentation uh, right now on your screen, you can see that there's a PowerPoint slide that can be downloaded on, uh, from this page. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see a link that says download, and a PDF file will uh, be made available, and, and you can have it on your computer so you can look at it anytime after the webinar or even during it. If you're a health professional, I've got good news. Um, as always, you can earn one free CEU through the American Society on Aging. If you registered as a health professional and indicated you would like a CEU, then you'll receive one um, an email by the end of today with the steps on how you actually go about collecting your CEU. But remember, you only have 30 days to do so. That's until February 15th to collect that free CEU. And so now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Um, today, our speaker is going to be Dr. Ronald Pfeiffer. He's at um, OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University in um, Portland. It's also a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. Now, Dr. Pfeiffer uh, hails from Nebraska, where he did his undergrad and, and medical school. Uh, he completed his neurolo neuro neurological training at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. And his focus is really on three different areas of Parkinson's disease, uh, clinical trials, genetic aspects, and gastrointestinal dysfunction, which is a, a, you know, a key non-motor feature of Parkinson's disease. He's participated in, in numerous clinical trials. Uh, was chair of the Movement Disorders Section for the American Academy of Neurology, um, and uh, has authored numerous uh, journals and uh, books related to Parkinson's disease. Um, he currently serves as a co-editor-in-chief of the journal Parkinsonism and Related Disorders. Um, sorry, that's from 2008 to 2017. And, and so he remains very active within the PD community, and, and uh, it's really our pleasure to have him here. Um, Dr. Pfeiffer, uh, welcome. Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Uh, the topic of my talk today is going to be non-motor symptoms, uh, what's new. And uh, these are my financial disclosures, uh, none of which are particularly or specifically germane to what we'll be talking about today. You know, for about the first 150 years, uh, following James Parkinson's uh, description of what we now call Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease was primarily considered to be a, a problem with movement, uh, a motor disorder characterized by the triad of tremor, rigidity or stiffness, and uh, slowness in movement or bradykinesia, and then in the later stages also with balance impairment. But uh, in the last uh, 25 years or so, it's been increasingly recognized that that's just the tip of the Parkinson iceberg and that there are a host of other facets or features of Parkinson's disease that have little or nothing to do with motor function, and so they are now collectively called the non-motor features of Parkinson's disease. Uh, on the right hand, uh, if you're looking at the slides, uh, I have grouped uh, non-motor uh, features into five different categories. It's a very broad topic, and uh, I realized as I was putting this together there was no way to cover all of them. Uh, so uh, at the risk of uh, having done a little bit of a bait and switch when, when it was advertised that we would talk about uh, all of the, the non-motor features, I won't be talking about the ones in blue, the sleep disorders and behavioral changes uh, in Parkinson's disease today. However, uh, the, the reason I dropped those out is not because they were not important, but because they are so important that they actually have been the topics of whole sessions 
in previous expert briefings uh, devoted to the topics. In 2017, in June, there was uh, uh, a whole topic on sleep disorders, and there have been uh, also in 2017 and 2018 uh, sessions on depression, on cognitive changes in dementia. So you can go back into the archives and, and review those. And today I'm going to focus on uh, some lesser uh, studied, the lesser, talk, uh, lesser talked about is bad English. My father, the English professor, is turning over in his grave. Uh, but we're going to be talking about some abnormalities of sensation, autonomic dysfunction, and just briefly mentioning fatigue and a few other uh, non-motor features. So first question you might be asking is, is why should there be non-motor features in Parkinson's disease? And to understand that, you have to to understand where Parkinson's disease first makes its appearance in, in the brain, where the pathology starts. And the work uh, from Dr. Heiko Brock and his colleagues a number of years ago now uh, indicated that there are two areas where, where uh, Parkinson's pathology first appears. Uh, the first is in the area of the olfactory nuclei uh, that receive their innervation from the nose. And the second uh, is down at the bottom of the brain stem, specifically in a nucleus called the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Uh, that is the origin of the, the vagus nerve that you might be familiar with. As time goes by and the disease progresses, the pathology, particularly the pathology in the bottom of the brain stem, gradually moves up the brain stem and eventually reaches the top of the brain stem, the midbrain, which is where that nucleus called the substantia nigra resides. And that's where the dopamine neurons that control or, uh, or have to do with motor dysfunction or movement are located. So there's quite a lot of pathology that goes on before the motor areas of the brain are damaged. And as it turns out, as the disease process moves up that brainstem, centers that are involved with gastrointestinal function, bowel function, stomach function, uh, bladder function, sleeping, and other aspects uh, of, of uh, neurological function are damaged before the motor function areas are damaged. And so uh, it then shouldn't be surprising that as those areas are damaged, symptoms uh, arise. And uh, on the slide now in front of you are some areas of non-motor dysfunction that can appear very early in the course of Parkinson's disease. Uh, impaired olfaction, of course, related to that uh, early involvement of the olfactory nuclei. Uh, constipation, uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, something called REM sleep behavior disorder related to damage in uh, centers in the lower brainstem. Uh, and then things like depression and anxiety can also occur early in Parkinson's disease for reasons that are not uh, quite as uh, crystal clear. How early can non-motor features develop? Uh, well, for one example, uh, Uiki and colleagues have looked at constipation, uh, and they, they gathered almost 100 patients, half of whom had uh, been bothered by constipation before the motor features of Parkinson's developed. And when they looked at when the constipation started in those people, uh, they found that it was right at about 40 years of age. And in those people, on average, the motor features and therefore the, the diagnosis, if you will, of Parkinson's disease wasn't made until almost 20 years later, uh, 58, 59 years. So constipation had made its appearance almost 20 years before the motor features developed. And that sort of uh, uh, early appearance can also be seen uh, in uh, impaired olfaction. It can be seen with, with something called REM sleep behavior disorder and un, uh, other non-motor features appearing years uh, and sometimes even decades before the development of motor features. Well, how important are motor features? You know, we, we tend to think of Parkinson's disease disability being due to the motor dysfunction, the stiffness, the slowness, and they certainly can and do produce motor dysfunction. But particularly as Parkinson's disease progresses, non-motor features 
uh, become increasingly important as a source of disability, especially some of the behavioral changes, depression, and even more importantly, cognitive difficulty and, and even dementia can become the dominant features in advanced Parkinson's disease and can be a major cause of both hospitalization and ultimately institutionalization. So uh, non-motor features are clearly a very important uh, facet of Parkinson's disease uh, that it's important uh, we know about. So let's let's talk about some abnormalities of sensation. I'm going to just mention three of them. There are more. Uh, we'll talk briefly about olfactory impairment, uh, talk about visual dysfunction, and then talk about pain. Impaired sense of smell is evident in the vast majority of people with Parkinson's disease if you test for it. Uh, anywhere from 70 to 90% of people with Parkinson's disease have some impairment of sense of smell. It's not that sense of smell is lost, but that it takes a stronger smell for the patient to perceive it. Another interesting facet that uh, the explanation for which isn't entirely clear is that not all smells seem to be infected, uh, affected, and uh, some odors uh, are, are more difficult for Parkinson patients to perceive than others. I give some examples, uh, such as licorice, coconut, and banana being especially impaired. Uh, I don't know of any treatment currently available for impaired sense of smell in patients with Parkinson's disease. The question is sometimes asked is whether uh, levodopa might help sense of smell, and I don't think there's any good evidence that it does. Visual dysfunction is surprisingly common in people with Parkinson's disease also. Uh, patients may describe a variety of, of visual symptoms. They may say they have tired eyes. They may say they have blurred vision. Double vision can occur. Usually it comes and goes intermittently, and at least one study has suggested that as many as 14% of patients with Parkinson's disease may experience uh, episodes of double vision. People with Parkinson's disease often say they have difficulty doing things up close, like reading, and they often also will say that they have real trouble in dim lighting conditions. Driving at night might be an example of that, or just uh, trying to read the menu in a, in a restaurant. What's particularly frustrating for people with Parkinson's disease is that they've gone to their optometrist or their ophthalmologist even, and the routine eye exam has been normal. Uh, you know, with glasses, your vision, uh, your visual acuity is great. You should be fine, but they're not. They have all these symptoms. And if the, uh, the eye docs would look further, they would actually find a variety of abnormalities. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease tend to have what's called convergence insufficiency. Uh, when you want to look at something up close, you have to kind of move your eyes uh, together, get them a little cross-eyed, if you will. And people with Parkinson's disease have difficulty doing that. Uh, if you test for it, people with Parkinson's disease may have impaired color perception, although that doesn't really contribute to difficulty with vision per se. Most people with Parkinson's disease blink less frequently, and that can cause drying out of the eyes and irritation of the surface of the eye. Uh, but some people with Parkinson's disease will blink excessively, and in, even in some other people, although this is a relatively small percentage, may find that they have difficulty keeping their eyes open. Uh, the fancy word for that is apraxia of eyelid opening but uh, their eyes may close and then they just can't get them open and sometimes have to actually pry them, opening, uh, pry them open. And perhaps most importantly, uh, people with Parkinson's disease may have something called reduced contrast sensitivity. The chart on the slide to the right is a little different than the usual eye chart with, that starts with the big E and then every letter gets, uh, every line, the letters get smaller and smaller. That standard ophthalmology chart is to look at how well you can see tiny objects. This chart is a little different in that the letters are all the same size, but they get progressively more faint as you go down the chart. And, and this is designed to look at how well uh, people can see faint things. And people with Parkinson's disease have difficulty perceiving the lower uh, uh, levels of, of this chart, and that's due to this uh, problem called reduced contrast sensitivity. The reason why that may occur in people with Parkinson's disease comes back once again to dopamine. This is work from Dr. Ivan Bodas-Walner and his 
colleagues, uh, and it's uh, looking at pictures of the back of the eye, the retina, and you can see that little valley or dip in the middle of the picture. That's called the fovea. And in people with Parkinson's disease, there seems to be some loss of uh, tissue uh, in, in what actually is loss of neurons uh, around the fovea. And it turns out that there are dopamine neurons in the, in the retina, and, and those dopamine neurons are lost, first damaged and then lost. And that's probably the reason why people uh, have reduced contrast sensitivity. So how do you treat the visual symptoms in Parkinson's disease? It turns out there's there's been one recent study, not in Parkinson's patients, but uh, in, in in patients in general, uh, showed that that people who play a lot of video games seem to have better contrast sensitivity than people who don't, and so uh, the question might be raised: raised uh, should we uh, be looking at uh, having Parkinson patients with impaired contrast sensitivity? Uh, play a lot of video games to see if that improves their contrast sensitivity. Uh, unproven at this point in time, but I thought interesting. For people who have intermittent diplopia, uh, fitting glasses with prisms can sometimes reduce or even eliminate the double vision. For, the contra or for convergence insufficiency, the difficulty seeing things up close, eye-focusing exercises like pencil push-ups can be helpful. Pencil push-ups are when you take a pencil and, and look at a, a letter or writing on the pencil and then slowly bring that pencil closer and closer, trying to keep focused uh, on the letter or the writing that you're looking at. Uh, those are pencil push-ups. And for people who have that difficulty keeping the eyelids open, uh, botulinum toxin injections sometimes can be helpful. So, so there are treatments for at least some aspects of visual dysfunction in patients with Parkinson's disease, and, and it's important to know that and pursue that. What about pain in Parkinson's disease? It doesn't get talked about very often, and neurologists uh, are often uh, not particularly good at, at dealing with pain uh, in, in Parkinson's disease. It's not even clear how, how common it is, uh, but in talking to a lot of patients, I would say it's quite common and can occur in a variety of forms. Dr. Blair Ford, who's at Columbia University a number of years ago, uh, wrote about pain and Parkinson's disease and divided it into to five categories that I have listed here. Perhaps the most common of those is, is musculoskeletal, and this refers to to, to problems with with the muscles themselves, uh, you know, if if muscles are are tight for a long period of time, they start to hurt. If you've ever carried anything heavy, uh, you know that you're, it starts to hurt after a while when you're carrying, and and that can be more broadly generalized uh, to muscles in Parkinson's disease. One of the most common areas for pain is in the shoulder. Uh, my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when I was 13 years old, but I remember in the year or so before he was diagnosed, he stopped playing catch with me in the backyard uh, because his shoulder was hurting, and he was diagnosed with bursitis and was treated with steroid injections, and they didn't help, and it was only when other features became apparent that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And, and uh, that's a relatively common a scenario for patients with Parkinson's disease where shoulder pain may have preceded the more obvious motor features. Because of changes with posture, and you can see this illustrated in the, the purple box uh, on, the, on the slides, because of changes with posture, uh, the propensity for nerve roots coming out of the spinal column to be pinched or compressed is higher, and so people with Parkinson's can, uh, disease can have what's called neuropathic or radicular pain. Uh, that's often uh, a sharp uh, electric shock type pain that may go down the arm or may go down the leg. Another type of pain that, that is relatively common in people with Parkinson's disease is due to prolonged contraction uh, of muscles uh, called dystonia that most often involves the toes or the feet uh, call it causing the toes to curl under or, or turn up and the foot to turn in. And when that goes on for a longer period of time, it can become quite painful. Uh, it tends to happen when the effect or the benefit of Parkinson medication wears off. 
uh, and tends to improve uh, when the medicine turns back on again. An uncommon cause of pain, but a very uh, difficult cause, is when there isn't anything in the muscles or nerves or joints producing the pain, but it's due to disturbances within the brain itself. That's called central pain in Parkinson's disease. It can be very disagreeable. It can involve odd locations like the throat, genital areas, rectal areas, things like that, and can drive people to distraction. Uh, and then finally, there's this thing called akathisia, where, uh, which was actually first described in people with psychiatric issues who were on uh, antipsychotic medication, which blocks dopamine function, and they develop this sense of, the, I got to move, I can't sit still, I got to get up and walk around, has some similarity to restless legs, but is probably a, a little bit different basis. But people with Parkinson's disease, again, especially when they're off, uh, can have this akathisia that can be very troublesome. As far as treating pain with Parkinson's disease, it depends on, on what's producing the pain as I just went through. If the pain is, is muscular in origin and it's occurring when the Parkinson medicine wears off, well then adjusting Parkinson medication, taking it more frequently, increasing the dose, or taking other measures may alleviate some or much of the pain. People with Parkinson's disease often ask about taking muscle relaxant medications, but my experience is that they're, that they're not usually very effective, and I tend not to prescribe them. Physical therapy can be particularly helpful if people uh, have a pinched nerve, or, but sometimes uh, surgical correction, uh, taking out a, a disc that's compressing a nerve, uh, becomes necessary. If a person is having that constant contraction of the toes or the feet, injection of botulinum toxin into the muscles to get them to relax uh, can be very helpful in alleviating the pain. Unfortunately, that central pain uh, can be very resistant to treatment. Let's move on and talk about the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the brain uh, and, and external or peripheral nervous system that controls things that we don't have to think about consciously, talking about blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, stomach function, intestinal function, bowel function, bladder function, sexual functioning, sweating, uh, temperature regulation. All those are things that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And if you talk to people or assess people with Parkinson's disease, uh, you will find, as we did in a study a number of years ago, that virtually all aspects of autonomic function uh, are, are injured or, or, or not functioning properly. Uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease. And if you sum all of those up uh, way over on the right-hand side of that graph, uh, you can see that autonomic symptoms are much more common uh, in people with Parkinson's disease. And I want to just talk about some of them, uh, and we'll start with uh, having to do with the cardiovascular system. And there are three things that, that we'll talk about. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, the sympathetic innervation of the heart is, is damaged and, and basically gone. Uh, a similar uh, thing would be true in someone who's had a heart transplant, uh, where the heart is transplanted and it's working just fine, but the autonomic uh, uh, innervation of the heart isn't there. doesn't typically produce any symptoms, but where it can be useful is in separating uh, Parkinson's disease uh, from uh, individuals with other Parkinson plus syndromes like multiple system atrophy or even pr progressive supranuclear palsy. In the uh, images that you have in front of you, on the right is a person with Parkinson's, uh, well, let's start on the left. Uh, that's a person who's normal, and you can see that sort of U-shaped uh, area of uh, increased uptake uh, within the blue circle. That's the heart. The bigger area over on the other side is the liver, and you can ignore that. Uh, but in a person with Parkinson's disease, you can see that uptake is, is essentially gone because the, the autonomic supply, uh, the sympathetic supply to the heart uh, is gone. Uh, in a person, and, and that the reason for that is that the pathology in Parkinson's disease isn't limited to the brain. It also affects the, uh, the nervous system outside the brain, the autonomic nervous system outside the brain. 
if you have a person who has multiple system atrophy, for example, though, there the pathology is, is primarily localized to the brain, not to the peripheral nervous system. And so they will have a normal MIBG scan, uh, whereas a person with Parkinson's disease has an abnormal test. Uh, so that can be very useful in trying to decide what process is going on. It has nothing really to do with treatment of autonomic dysfunction. I want to talk about uh, orthostatic hypotension, which is a fancy word uh, that means that your blood pressure drops when you stand up. Uh, that drop in blood pressure uh, when th with standing is very common in people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, some studies suggest that about 60% of people with Parkinson's disease will have dr significant drops in their blood pressure when they stand up. Doesn't produce symptoms in everybody, maybe in only uh, a third of those uh, who have the drop in blood pressure. Uh, but for those who do develop symptoms, this can be really important. The, the classic symptom that people with orthostatic hypotension have is to, to become woozy or lightheaded when they stand up. And that sometimes can become so prominent that people actually faint. On the other hand, uh, it can also produce a variety of other symptoms uh, that are often not associated with blood pressure dropping, uh, but, but should be. For example, uh, people with, with orthostatic hypotension may find when they stand up that their vision becomes fuzzy, or they may find that their thinking becomes foggy. Uh, other people may find that they develop a, a pain or a headache involving primarily the back of the neck and then the shoulders in what has been called a coat hanger type distribution or other people will find that they get pain in their lower back or in their buttock region. So, so it's, this is a case of literal uh, becoming a pain in the rear. The, these kinds of pain are, are due to impaired blood flow into those muscles when the blood pressure drops. Still other people with orthostatic hypotension may just feel very fatigued or lethargic when they stand up. So it's important to recognize uh, that sense of lightheadedness when you stand up, but it's also important to realize that these other features may occur in people with uh, orthostatic hypotension. Treatment is, is certainly available for orthostatic hypotension, and when you're treating it, what you're trying to do is reduce the symptoms, of course, uh, but also improve the person's ability to stand and therefore walk and ultimately prevent fainting and the falling that it goes along with fainting. The other side of the coin, though, that can happen with blood pressure regulation in Parkinson's disease uh, is that the blood pressure can actually rise too high when people are, are supine when they're laying down. Uh, you can think of this impairment of, of blood pressure regulation as being like a faulty thermostat. Uh, and uh, normally, uh, our autonomic nervous system keeps our blood pressure within a certain range that uh, uh, ensures that we get enough blood flowing up to the brain to prevent fainting and so on. But if the thermostat is, is not functioning well, it can allow the blood pressure to drop, but it also can allow the blood pressure to, to go too high when people are, are laying down. So how do you treat uh, the orthostatic hypotension? Uh, as an immediate treatment, uh, people will find that if they drink 12 to 16 ounces of water or even preferably ice water, that can cause a very immediate rise in blood pressure. And so some people will do that before they first get out of bed in the morning, since that's a time when, when the tendency for the blood pressure to drop uh, can be particularly prominent. Uh, when a person gets woozy when they're standing up, crossing their legs, flexing uh, their, their, their calf muscles, uh, getting up and down on their toes. Other physical maneuvers can sometimes serve to help pump blood out of the legs where it's pooling uh, up into the circulation. More chronically, you can treat orthostatic hypotension by increasing fluid and increasing salt consumption. Uh, elevating the head of bed at night, that makes it less likely for the blood pressure to drop when you get out of bed in the morning. It also uh, reduces the likelihood of the blood pressure getting real high while a person is sleeping. And then there's the issue of, of pressure stockings. Turns out that pressure stockings that just go up to below the knee don't 
do enough compression to increase blood flow sufficiently. And if you're going to wear pressure stockings, they really need to be at a minimum thigh high and preferably waist high, uh, like pantyhose, if you will. Or alternatively, some people will use an abdominal binder uh, to compress and get blood uh, from pooling uh, in the abdominal area, which is actually a much bigger vascular bed than, than the legs are. And then there are a variety of pharmacologic treatments to boost blood pressure. The most commonly used ones are fludrocortisone, which increases salt retention and fluid retention, mitodrine, which constricts blood vessels, pyridostigmine, which, which also can do that, and droxydopa, which I I imitates the effect of a transmitter called nor norepinephrine uh, that, um, again, is involved with blood, pressure, uh, blood vessel constriction. Other uh, medicines uh, have been utilized, but there's much less evidence to support their efficacy. It's important to remember that the uh, NOH stands for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension that we've just been talking about. That can be the major reason why blood pressure might drop uh, in people with Parkinson's disease, but there can be other sources for this also. Medications that are used to treat Parkinson's disease, chiefly levodopa, or the dopamine agonist medicines can cause blood pressure to drop. And people with Parkinson's disease often don't drink a lot of fluid because everything is slower and they have some difficulty swallowing. Uh, and so reduced blood volume or dehydration can occur in addition to the medications on top of the neurogenic uh, hypotension itself. And all of this can lead to increased likelihood of the blood pressure dropping. Another area where blood pressure can drop uh, is uh, after eating. Uh, the fancy word for that is postprandial hypotension. And you can see from the graph here that the person uh, being looked at uh, was a, had a blood pressure of 130 over 80 before they ate the meal, but uh, within 15 minutes after eating the meal, their blood pressure had dropped to like 80 over 50. Uh, large carbohydrate meals can trigger this. It typically develops within about 15 minutes and then may last for several hours. And so uh, people uh, may faint when they get up from the table. Occasionally people will get lightheaded and even faint uh, at the table. Uh, as far as dealing with this, uh, smaller meals, lower carbohydrate loads uh, can alleviate this problem. But sometimes I just tell people to plan on taking a nap after you eat a big meal and let it uh, work itself out while you're sleeping. Another issue I'm not going to say a lot about uh, is that in people with Parkinson's disease, sometimes the blood pressure doesn't drop at night, which is the usual pattern, but in, instead may actually elevate. And so the term non-dipping has been used for this. And, and uh, for some people, blood pressures can get dangerously high at night, even to the point that uh, sometimes it's necessary to use a medicine to lower blood pressure uh, at bedtime, uh, and then use medicines to increase blood pressure during the daytime hours. What about gastrointestinal dysfunction in Parkinson's disease? Uh, again, uh, it turns out it's quite common. We did some work a number of years ago that, that showed that these are the areas uh, of, of GI dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. I want to just focus on a, a couple of them. Uh, excess saliva is very common. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, anywhere from uh, a little over 50 to almost three-quarters of people uh, will notice that they have too much saliva in their mouth. Uh, that may just be drooling at night, but it may get to the point that they have to carry a handkerchief around with them. I used to have a patient who would uh, take uh, paper napkins and roll them up to look like a cigar and keep that in his mouth uh, like a cigar to kind of sop up the excess saliva. You might think that that must mean that people with Parkinson's disease make too much saliva. They actually don't. They make less uh, than normal, but they don't swallow their saliva as frequently. They don't swallow it as efficiently, uh, and so it accumulates in the mouth. And then people with Parkinson's disease uh, have a tendency for their mouth to be held open a little bit. And when you couple that with stooped posture, uh, that can result in drooling. So how do you treat the salivary excess? If it's just occasional, if it's embarrassing during social situations, the simplest thing is to have people chew gum or suck on hard candy because that turns the swallowing into a more conscious and more frequent 
um, uh, action, and that reduces the amount of saliva in the mouth. If it's more pervasive during the day, then you can look at things that might reduce saliva formation. What I tend to use initially is, is uh, atropine, and, and those are atropine eye drops. And what you have the person do is put a drop of the atropine eye drops on or under the tongue once or maybe twice a day. Uh, there are other medicines that, that uh, also can, can reduce saliva formation. Glycopyrrolate or robinol is another example of that. If that doesn't work uh, or isn't tolerated, uh, the ultimate way to treat uh, drooling in patients with Parkinson's disease is to inject the, the, the salivary uh, the, the salivary glands with botulinum toxin, which reduces saliva formation, and that can be very effective. In the past, surgical techniques were used, but they really should not be used, and that's why that red X is there. On the other hand, people with Parkinson's disease sometimes find they have a dry mouth, and, and that shouldn't be surprising because saliva production is reduced. Medications can sometimes magnify that, uh, and it's important to deal with that because not only is a dry mouth uncomfortable, but it also increases the risk of cavity formation and uh, periodontal disease. Uh, as far as treating dry mouth in Parkinson's disease, you can get over-the-counter artificial saliva products like biotine, which contains xylitol and glycerin, so it's sort of a lubricant. But there also are prescription medicines that can increase saliva formation. Pilocarpine is perhaps the best known of those, uh, but uh, sevamiline uh, is another one. These are medicines that are mostly used in a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, uh, where people have a dry mouth. But uh, I have one patient on pilocarpine currently, and, and it works very well. Bad breath in Parkinson's disease is an issue you don't see written about or talked about, but it's relatively common. Multiple factors contribute to it, including dry mouth and just physical difficulty uh, brushing and cleaning. Uh, that leads to more bacteria in the mouth and, uh, and uh, problems. How do you deal with that? Well, getting an electric toothbrush can make it easier to clean the mouth uh, using uh, the things we've just talked about, and also mouthwashes can be helpful. Impaired gastric emptying is another issue with Parkinson's disease, and uh, it's important uh, uh, for the stomach to empty properly because if it doesn't, uh, food gets stuck there, but so do medications get stuck in the stomach. And when food gets stuck in the stomach, uh, it can cause reduced appetite, early fullness, even nausea, vomiting, uh, bloating, and eventually weight loss. There are a variety of medicines, and I'm not going to go into detail on this uh, because time is getting short, uh, but there are a variety of medicines that can be used to try and improve gastric emptying. Uh, and uh, these are medicines that are generally uh, administered by a gastroenterologist, uh, but sometimes by neurologists also. Uh, if medicines don't work, and if the problem is that the, the pyloric sphincter at the end of the stomach isn't uh, releasing or relaxing to let food out of the stomach, botulinum toxin injections have been used into the pyloric sphincter with some benefit. And uh, in people with diabetic gastroparesis, uh, a pacemaker, a gastric pacemaker has been used. I'm not aware of that being used in Parkinson's disease. Uh, if levodopa gets stuck in the stomach because it's not emptying, you don't get a response when you take the medication. And that's true with other medicines also because they're generally absorbed in the small intestine. Well, you can get around that with some medication approaches, uh, the uh, intestinal infusion of levodopa would be an example. Constant subcutaneous infusion of apomorphine would be another example. Or the reticotine skin, skin patch would be another example. That improves medicine responsiveness, but it doesn't help the, the treatment of uh, the symptoms uh, of gastroparesis itself. The large intestine is usually covered with uh, 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 bacteria, trillions of them, but the small intestine typically is not. Uh, sometimes, though, it, bacteria makes its way from the colon into the small intestine. 
and that's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And as it turns out, a good number of people with Parkinson's disease have this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And if it gets severe enough, it can actually impair absorption of nutrients. And I've always wondered if it might be responsible for the weight loss uh, in Parkinson's disease. It's probably related to impaired motility in the small intestine. It can produce bloating, gassiness, and perhaps some other symptoms. But perhaps more importantly, what it also can do is impair absorption of medication. And so people with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth may find that it takes longer for their medicine to work. It may wear off more quickly. There may be uh, periods or times when a dose doesn't work at all. And uh, Alfonso Fasano and his group have shown that if you treat the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with antibiotics, you can improve medication responsiveness. The problem is that the underlying difficulty doesn't go away uh, and uh, people uh, will get the SIBO back again. I'm going to skip this slide. And uh, I'm actually going to uh, go briefly over uh, constipation and Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are two parts of constipation and Parkinson's disease. One is reduced bowel movement frequency. That's pretty straightforward to treat with increased fiber, increased fluid. If that doesn't work, stool softeners can help. Miralax uh, is very helpful for many people. Uh, and there are other uh, treatments that, that improve or increase mobility through the colon. Um, the other aspect of bowel dysfunction, though, is when the sphincter muscles don't relax and this other muscle called the puborectalis muscle don't relax, and that can result in increased straining, difficulty with defecation, painful defecation, and incomplete uh, defecation. And there isn't any tried-and-true treatment for that. Uh, apomorphine injections may be helpful. Some people will find that they have an easier time having a bowel movement when they're on as opposed to when they're off. Uh, in, in Italy, a group has done botulinum toxin injections into the sphincters, but the standard treatment still remains biofeedback techniques or uh, uh, muscle training of the pelvic musculature. We really don't have great treatment for defecatory dysfunction, and more work needs to be done in that regard. There are two aspects to bladder dysfunction in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the most common is an irritable or overactive bladder that results in uh, frequent urination, getting up multiple times at night, having to get to the bathroom quickly. And if you can't get there quickly enough because of difficulty walking, uh, sometimes some bladder leaking. There are a variety of treatments for that. Uh, by and large, these are drugs that block uh, a transmitter called acetylcholine. Older ones like oxybutynin and tolteridine work but they also get into the brain and can cause memory problems. Newer ones like trospium, terafenicin, and solafenicin either don't get into the brain or they have a more selective effect on the bladder and are probably preferable to use in people with Parkinson's disease. And then there's uh, the recent addition, this mirabegron, which doesn't work on acetylcholine at all, but uh, works on uh, noradrenaline. Uh, for People that uh, uh, those medicines don't work, botulinum toxin injections into the detressor muscle in the bladder are sometimes useful. Uh, I'm going to pass on sacral nerve stimulation. Less frequently, people with Parkinson's disease can have a lazy bladder where the, the, the fluid keeps building up and up and up. Typically, people will have difficulty initiating urination. They may have a weak urinary stream, but if the pressure builds up, because there's so much fluid in the bladder, uh, they also may develop uh, incontinence due to overflow. And it's important to remember that men can get this same problem due to an enlarged prostate gland. The treatment of obstructive symptoms then uh, is primarily aimed at, at reducing prostate size, and that doesn't help women with this problem. Uh, parasympathetic agent, bethanicol, uh, can sometimes help this in men and women, but in all honesty, if people have obstructive or lazy bladder uh, dysfunction in Parkinson's disease, uh, intermittent catheterization is typically needed. Sexual dysfunction often doesn't get talked about 
in Parkinson's disease. It's very common. Uh, erectile dysfunction, reduced libido or desire, decreased ability to achieve organ orgasm is very common in men with Parkinson's disease. Reduced vaginal sensitivity and decreased desire or libido is very common in, in women. Uh, as far as treatment, uh, there are a variety of drugs and, and approaches that can be used for erectile dysfunction. If libido is diminished, desire is diminished in men, uh, and their testosterone levels are low, then testosterone might be a useful uh, treatment. If the problem is lubrication, lubricants uh, can be utilized. Temperature dysregulation uh, is, is another one of these things of Parkinson's that doesn't get talked about much. I want to mention hyperhidrosis. Uh, some studies would suggest that over 50% of people with Parkinson's have high, uh, excess sweating, primarily involving the head and neck, and typically they get sudden drenching sweats. Uh, sometimes it occurs when the medicine effect wears off. Sometimes it's when they're having a lot of dyskinesia, but sometimes it can occur for no reason whatsoever. And it can be very difficult to treat. If it's occurring when medicine is wearing off, adjusting medicine may help. Same thing with dyskinesia. But if it's just happening out of the blue, medicines tend not to help. There has been at least one study that suggests that a subthalamic deep brain stimulation surgery may reduce hyperhidrosis. Uh, and uh, if the sweating is localized to the armpits, you can do botulinum toxin injections. Fatigue is another unrecognized, uh, understudied aspect of non-motor dysfunction. It's common. Uh, some people uh, rank a surprising number of people rank it as the worst symptom of their Parkinson's uh, and, and one of their most disabling symptoms. We don't really know what causes it, whether it's a problem in the brain or in the muscles, and so treatment is really not well formulated. There are some studies that suggest exercise helps a variety of medications have been tried uh, with inconsistent results. In, in the short, and uh, is, is that we really don't have good treatment for fatigue and Parkinson's disease. Finally, I will just briefly mention uh, people with Parkinson's disease will sometimes say they're short of breath, and what is often happening there is that rigidity in their, their chest wall muscles prevents full expansion of the chest, and that produces a sense of shortness of breath. And, and once again, trying to reduce off time or reduce dyskinesia can sometimes help. Treating anxiety uh, can help. Uh, and uh, there is something called inspiratory and expiratory muscle strength training that has also been utilized. And with that, uh, just a quick summary uh, of uh, non-motor dysfunction in Parkinson's disease, uh, that it's important we recognize it and, and it's important to recognize that effective treatment may exist for at least some aspects of it. Uh, I apologize for talking a little bit windily and long here, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pfeiffer. That was uh, fantastic. Really appreciate uh, your approach and you know, having worked with you on our uh, you know, many aspects of what the foundation is doing, trying to cover non-motor symptoms, particularly you know, working group on gastric dysfunction, um, you really uh, have command of this material and, and appreciate you sharing that with our community today. Um, I want to dive into questions, you know, recognizing we're, we're uh, coming up towards the top of the hour. And, and one of the ones that uh, uh, come through and um, is uh, frequently a uh, topic today, and this one comes from a health professional in Canada. That's about marijuana. Um, or CBD or, or various forms as a treatment for pain in Parkinson's. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, as, as many people may know, uh, marijuana is legal in Oregon, so uh, a surprising number of my patients actually uh, have experimented with, with uh, CBD, not, not THC, but CBD, and used it for a variety of things, uh, anxiety and pain perhaps being the most common. Uh, and, and for some people... Uh, certainly, anxiety can be diminished. Insomnia can be helped. Uh, pain is a little more inconsistent, and I think it would be fair to say that some people um, derive relief of their pain from the CBD, but uh, others don't. Um, and so if it's legal, 
I, I, uh, I don't encourage people, but I don't dissuade them from experimenting to see whether it helps them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is a topic that uh, has captured our attention as well, and we're going to be hosting a, uh, a, a real roundtable to try to understand its utility in Parkinson's disease, and it's going to be uh, coming up uh, this spring and in, in, um, appropriately enough in, in Colorado uh, with uh, Dr. Benji Kluger and uh, Dr. John Stossel. Um, you know, two, one, uh, two MDSs who, who have some uh, thoughts and experience on this, uh, along with many other people. Um, just to provide some uh, feedback for our community, uh, we have uh, you know, over 2,200 uh, people registered for our talk today and over 700 people uh, listening live. Uh, welcome, everyone, and particularly from our Ohio chapter with 23 people and, and Minnesota chapter 27 uh, folks for viewing parties. So uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. Um, you know, when you listen to a lot of these uh, non-motor features, uh, it seems that uh, the timing between the drug uh, that you, uh, people are taking, the, the, dis, um, the levodopa, uh, and uh, when the symptoms appear is something that, that's important. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, the, uh, the, 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 if, you take the, if you take your medicine, it's for for levodopa, for example, to work. It has to not only get to the stomach, which can be a problem uh, in Parkinson's disease. It has to get through the stomach into the intestine to get absorbed. So, in the best of circumstances, there's going to be a delay of, say, 15 to 20 minutes before you would ever see any effect from the medicine you take. If there's impaired gastric emptying, uh, that can be even longer, and sometimes people won't perceive the effect of their medicine for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and sometimes they may ne may not get any benefit from a dose at all uh, because of these uh, abnormalities in getting the drug to the intestine. I don't know if that's what Thanks, you were sir. asking. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for trying to rescue a, a poorly uh, phrased question. I, I guess what I was getting at um, is that the timing, you know, a lot of, a lot, it seems like some of these um, non-motor symptoms occur as people are going off or going on. And, uh, and so the, uh, the tracking symptoms vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the timing of when they're taking medication is important. Do you absolutely. encourage people to, do you encourage people to, you know, to, uh, track their symptoms in a notebook? I mean, is that one way to help facilitate that uh, conversation yeah. with their physician? That can be very helpful uh, for for the physician uh, if if a person has been looking at this and can say, yeah, it's it's uh, when I wear off that I get this bloating or uh, that this or that happens. That can be tremendously useful. I all, I, I would caution people uh, though not to take it to extremes, and you don't need to keep a diary every day for months at a time. If you just do a, a few days here and there, that can be tremendously uh, helpful for your physician. Uh, excellent. That's, that's good advice. And for those who are uh, uh, on the screen, you'll notice we have our survey up there that I talked about at the top of the top of the hour. And encourage everyone to uh, uh, complete that. Um, you know, one um, you know, non-motor symptom which can be kind of troubling um, for uh, the uh, person with Parkinson's and, and, the, and their loved ones around them is, you know, I've heard about um, uh, you know even in non-emotional situations, sometimes people may. Uh, show emotion uh, sure. where they'll cry um, spontaneously. Um, is this something that you know you've, you've seen a lot in Parkinson's disease? This is from a, a someone in North Dakota who's a has a friend of someone with Parkinson's disease and yeah. is and witnessing this. You know, concerned. Yeah, the, the the fancier technical term for that is pseudobulbar affect, and and that's that that certainly occurs to some people with Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I don't know. It's not super common, but it does occur. And, it, and there is a, a medication that's been specifically developed uh, to treat that pseudobulbar affect, where people may cry when they're not particularly sad. They may laugh in inappropriate situations. Uh, it's, it's a combination of uh, two drugs. Uh, and and uh, if a person is having that symptom complex, mentioning it to your primary care doc or your, I'm sorry, even more important, to your neurologist uh, can result in, in getting put on effective treatment uh, for that problem. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned I thought was really a good practical advice uh, for helping to deal with um, orthostatic hypotension was you know, drinking that glass of water. 
Um, another one seemed to be the, this idea of an abdominal binder. What, what is an abdominal binder? Um, and yeah, how do you, where do you get that? You, you, you can buy them at uh, medical supply companies or probably even Walgreens, I, I would guess, uh, but certainly medical supply companies. It's just a, a, a band with a Velcro uh, stay on it that, that you wrap around your abdomen and cinch it tight. It, in essence, it's a girdle. Ah, that that, okay. that that squeezes in the abdomen. It's all, kind of like one of those things that people use when they're lifting heavy weights or something that helps yeah, provide exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And and you have the thing is you have to make sure that you cinch it tight enough that it's actually squeezing something. You can't just kind of put it on loosely and and fool oh, yourself. Got to really kind of help suck in that gut, if you will. Uh, yeah. For those who have yeah. one, like myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. My wife so, keeps telling me I should have one. <laughs> uh, yes, thanks for for men. Um, you know, I, I, another question has come in uh, that uh, you know we, t- we talked about uh, salvation and uh, issues. You know, people ha- sometimes you know can be associated with um, bad breath. You know, oral oral conditions uh, can be an issue. Um, is there something that you find that you know that is it because um, you know, swallowing can be problematic, or is it because uh, you know the issue with um, maybe medications making dry mouth or other issues. Have you had to troubleshoot, uh, um, I guess, halitosis is the fancy word for bad breath in people with PD? Is that part yeah, of PD? I, yeah, I, I think the, the, the reason why people with Parkinson's might develop bad breath has, has uh, to do with, with the, the dry mouth and, and combined with, with maybe uh, impaired ability to really clean the mouth you know, people with Parkinson's have difficulty with back and forward motions, and brushing your teeth is all that. And, and so people with Parkinson's may not be able to brush well, and, and food accumulates, sits there, and, and uh, in, in a, uh, one sense uh, starts to break down, and that can, can cause smells. So uh, uh, treating the dry mouth, uh, as I mentioned, and, and also – Getting an electric tooth, toothbrush, which which can clean uh, much better than than a manual toothbrush, uh, and then using mouthwash you know, a couple times a day, three times a day, can reduce uh, the, the the severity, if you will, of, of the the halitosis. Uh, you know, going to the other end um, uh, of the body of the you know the GI tract. It, um, the issue regarding um, you know, constipation is an issue. The flip side is, have you um, uh, observed uh, incontinence of the bowel as a problem? Uh, you know, loss of sphincter strength for people with PD? Is that something that fluctuates uh, with, with some yeah. disease? Yeah, it, 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 fec- the fancy word would be fecal incontinence, and that can and does occur in, in people with Parkinson's disease. It's not real common but probably more common than than might be perceived. Some of it may be related to 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 impaired sphincter control per se. Other parts of it may be related to against as with bladder dysfunction, just difficulty getting to the bathroom, getting the trousers or down and and you know getting sat down that that there may just be difficulty holding it long enough, so sort of an urge incontinence, if you will. Um, and, and treating fecal incontinence can be be difficult. Uh, you know, if it's a matter of getting there in time, then uh, uh, trying to, to improve motor function becomes important. If it's a problem with the the, the sphincters, uh, pelvic floor exercises might might provide some benefit. But it can be a, a difficult and, of course, an embarrassing problem to deal with. So. Um, and another issue um, is, you know, the skin uh, with, with people with Parkinson's disease, and sometimes they have you know, some uh, skin problems. So, you know, is there any uh, straightforward way to deal with it, you know, um, as you're encountering? Yeah, it, that, you know, the, 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 the classic abnormality is the seborrheic dermatitis where people get this flaky, oily, and how you get flaky and oily at the same time is sort of a mystery, but people with Parkinson's do. But this flaky, oily skin over the eyebrows, over the forehead, the nose, and the cheeks, um, 
that can be kind of a, it's it's not a life threatening problem, but it's embarrassing. And how to deal with that? My, this is my practical answer. I send people to the dermatologist, and and using their their creams and ointments, they often can prescribe useful treatments in in minimizing that for patients. Excellent. And as we're approaching the top of the hour, I just want to remind our listeners that you know what uh, uh, you know Dr. Pfeiffer is talking about. We have many fact sheets online. If you were to go to our um, on our website and looking for living with living with Parkinson's disease, you can find our PD library and you can search on a multitude of topics. Uh, um, many of these are are covered uh, in the talk today, but you can get more information about that. And, and you always uh, can reach out to our um, my colleagues at the foundation by calling our, our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO, and they, uh, uh, someone on the phone can help uh, talk with you about your problems um, that you may be having and, and help find solutions. Um, I also want to just give a, a shout-out for our, our next webinar, which is uh, going to be uh, uh, coming up in March 5th. Um, that's going to be Dr. Dan Gold, who's going to really cover – um, issues regarding um, eye issues in Parkinson's disease. He's a professor of neurology, ophthalmology um, at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And if you want to go back to today's uh, webinar and listen to it again, uh, because of a tremendous amount of information that Dr. Pfeiffer covered, we'll have that available uh, next Tuesday, uh, January 22nd. Um, and you can find that at parkinson.org. You know, one final question, if I may, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer. And for someone who's listening to your your um, your discussion today about non-motor symptoms, we often talk about how they're often the symptoms that precede Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, people you know can it go back after they've been diagnosed and say, "Oh, I had this, I had that." If you are you know listening to this with your loved one and you've got family members affected with this, um, do you need to be worried about developing PD if you have some of these symptoms? What are your thoughts you know, about it? What do you tell people? Yeah, I, I think. The thing that you have to remember is that, say, for example, constipation. Uh, a lot of people have constipation, and not everybody with constipation is going to develop Parkinson's disease. Same thing with impaired sense of smell. Uh, probably the same thing with REM sleep behavior disorder, although that may be a little more specific. So, so for the most part, these non-motor features preceding uh, the the clear-cut development of what we call Parkinson's disease are are you know, suggestive, but they're not conclusive, and, and they're, they're not, uh, you can't use them to diagnose Parkinson's disease. So it might increase, particularly if you have family members with Parkinson's disease, it might increase your level of alertness to developing motor features, uh, but we still depend on the development of motor features to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Fantastic, and, and, I, and I think as you pointed out that you know, many of these features like constipation that that um, uh, people uh, deal with, there's good ways to, to uh, uh, deal with them um, um, for the general population um, in addition to you know, ways to help people with Parkinson's disease. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Pfeiffer, thank you very much for your uh, uh, discussion today. This was, uh, I think, a, a fantastic uh, a piece of information that uh, the community can really use. Have a good day. Well, thanks again.